Well, good evening. We started a lesson last week on living the victorious Christian life, and we spent uh, the whole service talking about that, and we looked about uh, how we as Christians can have victory, and God wants us to have victory. And we looked at last week, we kind of concluded our lesson uh, with learning how to have victory over the enemies, and we covered the flesh, and we covered the world. And we saw the applications, uh, four-step process on how to have victory over those things. And tonight we want to look at having victory over the devil. Our key verse last week and continuing this week was Romans 5, 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, of course that's referring to Adam, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. And we talked about the fact that uh, we get to live as kings and queens for Christ, by Christ, and through Christ because of our relationship with Him. And so as we get, continue this thought on having victory uh, in the Christian life, uh, let's have a word of prayer real quick, and then we'll just jump right into the message and give you just a little quick review, and then we'll finish the lesson up this evening. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We thank you for your blessings and your goodness. Thank you for the time we have to open your word and to look into it. Thank you for the victory you promised us. Thank you for the victory that's available to us, Lord, if we'll just claim it. Uh, bless this lesson now. Use it in our lives uh, to strengthen us, we pray. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. By the way, if you haven't noticed, I'm not here at the at, uh, at Benson, Arizona. We're not in church. This is a, a live stream only service, and you probably notice the scenery behind me. I'm in Florida. Uh, I went to a pastor's conference to get away and to get some refreshing, and was able to see my daughter here for a couple days as well. And so I'm coming to you from Florida here, and want to finish this lesson up. So last week we saw how to have victory over the world. Uh, we saw how to have victory over the flesh, and of course there's a four-step process: identify the enemy, understand the enemy. Realize God's provision for your victory and then translate Christ's victory into my own life or my own experience. And so let's look at this thought tonight. How can I have victory over the devil? And of course we know he is the uh, the wicked one and the evil one, the father of lies. And uh, so that's who we want to look at being able to defeat and have victory over this evening. Uh, how can I have victory over the devil? First of all, of course, we take our steps. Uh, first of all, we identify the enemy. Identify the enemy. According to 1 Peter 5, 8, the Bible tells us very clearly and very plainly that the devil is our adversary. Uh, it talks about him being a roaring lion, uh, walking about, seeking whom he may not just nibble on, not just mess with, but devour. And that's his goal is to destroy our lives. And so we need to understand as we identify this enemy of the devil, uh, he's not a friend. He's not a part-time enemy and a part-time friend. He is the adversary. Uh, so we identify the enemy. Secondly, then, we have to understand the enemy. How does he work? How does he fight? And, of course, like we've seen with the other enemies, uh, the world and the flesh, usually it's not a fair fight, and it's never a fair fight with him either. How does Satan attack the Christian? Uh, we saw how the world attacked the Christian, uh, allurement. We saw how the flesh attacked uh, the Christian, uh, uh, you know, feel good for yourself. And now we're going to see how this enemy, the devil, attacks the Christian. Well, the Bible teaches that the devil uses a very, uh, a various number of devices. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 warns us to not be ignorant of his devices. There's a lot of tools and weapons that Satan could use against us. We can spend a lot of time talking on them. I'm going to give you five here real quick. We'll have those on our, on our screen here for you. Uh, five quick ways or devices that Satan uses against us. Number one, he uses temptation. Temptation, 1 Thessalonians 3, 5 talks about that. Satan is a master of enticement. He's a master of showing you something that's good, uh, tempting you to try it. It won't hurt. Uh, give it a go. Everybody else is. Uh, and then he's got a hook in you. And uh, so he uses temptation as a way to attack us. Secondly, number two, he uses wiles. Uh, wiles, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, uh, talks about that, the wiles of the devil. This is crafty deception. Again, we, we talked about it a little bit when we talked about the world, but uh, he, he shows you the upside and the fun and the good thing about sin and how awesome it looks. He never shows you the repercussions. He never shows you the judgment or the punishment. He only shows you and entices you with what looks good. Uh, you ever you ever uh, seen those uh, wax uh, fruit bowls? And uh, man, that fruit looks really good. But if you were to bite and pick it up and take a bite out of it, you'd be miserably disappointed. Uh, that's Satan. He offers us with his wiles, with his crafty deception. He offers us these wonderful things, but in the end, they're not so wonderful. So he uses temptation. He uses wiles. Thirdly, he uses pride. First Timothy three six. Uh, Satan appeals to the flesh. Uh, he knows how to push our buttons. He knows where our pride level is. He knows uh, uh, what things to throw at us and what things to hit us with in the area of pride. And so he'll use our pride against us because he's a master of using devices. Number four, uh, boy, this is, a, this is a common one he uses. He uses discouragement. He 
uses discouragement. You ever been discouraged? I know we have. Uh, we need to understand sometimes in our lives that discouragement is not just uh, something that happens. Many times discouragement is something that Satan uh, stokes the flames of in our lives and tries to get us discouraged. Deuteronomy uh, chapter 1 talks about that a lot. But uh, he tries to throw discouragement at us and discouragement on top of discouragement and get you discouraged about being discouraged. It's, it's an amazing tool he uses, but it's very effective. And uh, he fights us with discouragement. The fifth one I'll just show you tonight as we're kind of understanding the enemy. Um, Ephesians 6.16 tells us he uses fiery darts of opposition. Uh, fiery darts. He talks about the shield of faith that we're supposed to have. and talks about he, he stands there and launches fiery darts. At. Sometimes he stands at a distance and he fights from a distance and he fights unfairly and he's just lofting stuff at us, just, just tossing stuff at us. And uh, he uses those and every now and then he'll clip us. Every now and then he'll hit his mark. And so we have to understand that the devil doesn't fight fairly. Uh, he's often in the background uh, behind the scenes fighting uh, trying to ruin us in our lives. So we identify the enemy, we understand the enemy. Then number three, we realize God's provision for victory. Uh, if we can beat the devil, of course, we have to understand that God is the one that provides that victory and enables us. So what is God's provision for victory? 1 John 3, 8 says this, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the flesh. Think about that. Our victory through Christ, his provision is this, he came, he lived, and he died to destroy the works of the devil. Uh, that's pretty good provision, friends. That's pretty amazing thought to think that was his purpose of living and dying was to defeat Satan for us. Uh, so we understand now, we realize God's provision for us. The second thing I put down about this, though, is um, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 says this, Through death he might destroy him that had power over death, that is the devil. Uh, so you see, the Lord Jesus Christ came and the purpose of his birth, his death, his resurrection, yes, was to provide salvation, but it also, according to these two verses, was to deal a blow to Satan, uh, was, was to take out the wicked one uh, so that we could have victory over him. So again, the victory is not won through us, it's won through his provision. That provision was provided by the death and the, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we see, uh, we identify the enemy, we understand him, we, we see God's provision. Now let's apply it, letter D. Let's translate Christ's victory into our own experience, all right? Uh, so let me give you four quick things, okay? Or actually, there's seven quick things, but four things here on this first slide. Number one, number one, remember this, you are on the winning side. Well, this is key because we forget this sometimes. In the battle we face, the struggles of life, uh, the circumstances we hit, uh, sometimes we look at life and say, man, this is hard. Realize this, no matter what happens in life, you are on the winning side. First John 4, 4, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. It doesn't matter what Satan says. It doesn't matter what the world says. It doesn't matter what your flesh says. Greater is he that is in me, Jesus Christ, than he that is in the world. Uh, so that's my own experience. Secondly, uh, according to 1 John 2, 14, uh, the Bible teaches that we overcome the wicked one when the word of God abides in us. Uh, so when we start applying this victory to our life that Christ has provided, first of all, realize you're on the winning team, but secondly, start applying and, and meditating and studying and memorizing the word of God. The more we use and the more we soak up and the more we apply, uh, the, the, the easier it is to reach into that when we need it. Uh, when we are tempted to do wrong, we need to fight the wicked one. Uh, so overcome the wicked one through the word of God. Number three, Ephesians chapter six tells us to put on the whole armor of God. If we're gonna fight the devil, we might as well be prepared. If we're going to fight the wicked one, who, by the way, is smarter, he's stronger, uh, uh, he, he, he's more apt than us, uh, he's able to do some things, he's deceptive, he has all these different uh, uh, methods. If he's so powerful, if I'm going to fight him, I might as well be ready. How do I do that? God says, let me, let me prepare you. Let me give you some armor to put on. Put on the whole armor of God, Ephesians 6 says. Don't pick and choose. It's not a, it's not a buffet. Put it all on. Put it all on. And when we do that, we can fight the devil. Look at this uh, number four. Look at the defensive items of the spiritual armor. Again, Christ is trying to give us victory and translate that to our own lives, how we can get it. Uh, he, so he gives us some armor, some weapons to put on. Look at, first of all, he gives us the belt, or the loins, he talks about girt with truth, the belt of truth, the word of God, Jesus Christ, we have truth. Secondly, you see the breastplate of righteousness. Uh, I'm not righteous, but because I'm saved, Christ's righteousness dwells in me and abides in me, and then I can turn around and show Christ's righteousness to others because of him in my life. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. That talks about the shoes uh, uh, shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Shoes of peace. Shoes of peace. Uh, live peacefully with all men at, at all possible times. Uh, we, we see that uh, point out other places in scripture as well. It talks about the shield of faith. 
the shield of faith. Again, uh, we are covered in our shield. Our, our defensive weaponry is this. I have faith in him. He's promised the victory. He, he, he died to defeat Satan. He rose again. He's already taken care of all that. He's in me. Uh, he's greater than the world and the opposition. I can trust him. The shield of faith. Uh, we lack faith sometimes in his, his uh, uh, victory working abilities. Uh, trust him. Have faith. Shield of faith. And then talk about the helmet of salvation. Those are all pieces of the armor God gives us to put on so that we can fight the devil who's standing back there launching his fiery darts as we saw earlier. Uh, so, so you see that, the defensive items. Number five, look at the, the offensive weapon he gives us. The Bible tells us he gives us the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit. You, you realize that offensively as a Christian, um, I don't have to come up with a strategy. I don't have to come up with a game plan. I have the Word of God. And the Word of God is powerful enough to defeat the enemy. Think about it, when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness three times, what did he use? The Word of God. Uh, if it's good for him, it's good for us as his followers. Uh, we have the Word of God as our offensive weapon, the sword of the Spirit. Number six, James 4, 7 tells us to resist Satan. Continue to say no, continue to say no, continue to say no, continue to say no. If I to resist the devil, he will flee from you. Eventually, he's going to get tired of pressing you. He's going to get tired of losing the battle. He's going to move on to a weaker Christian. Resist Satan. Number seven, Ephesians 4, 27 says uh, that we are not to give place to the devil. Don't give opportunity. Don't open a door. Don't open a crack or a window. Uh, don't allow him access to your life. Avoid him at all costs. Fight him at all costs. And, and don't put yourself in a position where that temptation is real uh, and where he's able to step into your life and wreak havoc. Uh, so that's translating that victory to our own experience. So we have seen how to have victory over the world. We've seen how to have victory over the flesh. Now we see tonight how to have victory over the devil. Let's cover two, a couple more points here real quick, and then we'll close. Uh, first of all, uh, number seven, number seven, let's look at the person of victorious living, the person of victorious living. The Christian who could be labeled a victorious Christian or could be labeled living a victorious Christian life, again, it's not because of who they are. We are a person of victory because of Jesus Christ and because of his, uh, his relationship with us in our lives and in our hearts. Because of the person of Christ, we can't have victory. So when you think about a person or a Christian of victory, again, it all stems back to Christ. Paul says, uh, Philippians 4.13, letter A, victory comes to our relationship with that person of Jesus Christ. It says, uh, what does it say? Uh, I can do all things through, 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 through Christ, through, again, through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Again, it's through Christ. Romans 8.37, we are more than conquerors through Christ that loved us. Uh, let us see, 1 Corinthians 15, 57. It says, He giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 2, 14. Which, causeth, uh, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. Well, you see a familiar phraseology there. Through, 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 and in, in, in. Here's the thing. Uh, if you were to go from one place to another, and you had to go through a tunnel, okay? Uh, that connects the two places, but you have to go through the tunnel to get to the next one. Here's, here's, the, here's the truth about the victorious Christian life. The Christian who's victorious doesn't get from point A to victory, point B, on his own. He has to go through the tunnel of Jesus Christ. He provides that victory. He provides that strength. He provides that resistance to temptation. Trust God and let him see you through. Uh, we can have victory. We can be a person that is a victorious Christian, but it's all through Jesus Christ. Number eight. Number eight, then. Let's look at the path to victorious living. The path to victorious living. I don't know if you've noticed as we've studied kind of through this, you've seen a familiar uh, 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 pattern. You've seen the Word of God coupled with faith always equals victory. The Word of God coupled with faith always equals victory. Uh, so if you think about that this evening, look at the path to victorious Christian living. First of all, letter A. According to Psalm 119 and Psalm 119, the 9 and 11, uh, it talks about the Word of God. Hiding God's word in our heart. Look at Psalm 119.9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Look at verse 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart. Why? That I might not sin against thee. So the path is very clear. Victorious living starts with the word of God. But secondly, the second part of the path, letter A, Matthew 26.41, there are two things that will help us avoid temptation. Watch and pray, the Bible says, that you enter not into temptation. Watch and pray. Uh, so we have to be aware. We have to be alert. 
and then we have to take it to the throne of grace. So the path of victory, again, is not by uh, a self-help book. It's not by going to a class. It's not by uh, achieving some good moral goals or a better moral compass. The path to, to spiritual victory is the Word of God, and it's watching and praying. It's very simple. Uh, it's hard to apply sometimes, but it's a pretty simple formula. Let me give you this, number nine. Number nine. Let me give you some closing counsel for victorious Christian living. Let me give you some closing thoughts here to help us in this area of living victoriously. First of all, letter A, don't lose heart. Christian growth comes slowly. Uh, you're gonna fail. You're not always gonna uh, win the victories you want. Don't expect instant maturity. This takes time. Uh, the Christian life is a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, we're continually learning, we're continually growing, and it's a slow process. James 1, 4 says, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Well, that's talking about completeness and well-rounded, but. Every day, patiently pray for growth. Every day you get up, think about it, your body is growing daily in some way, some shape, some form. Sometimes it's imperceptible, you don't see it. But uh, the Christian life ought to be continually growing. Over time, you'll see how far you've come as a Christian. But take the process slowly. Don't lose heart when you fail. Get up and try again. Keep on growing. Let her be. Guard your heart guard your heart. Again, I, I often say, you know, we put locks on our cell phones and locks on our homes and locks on our cars and locks on our computers, all those things. But the most important thing we need to put a lock on in the guard is our heart. Matthew 6 to 33, we know the verse, but seek ye first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. What's it mean? What it simply means is God wants your heart's affection. Uh, he doesn't want first affections. He wants all your heart's affections. He doesn't want just first place. He wants his rightful place, which is Lord of Lord and King of Kings. You know, I thought about that, and I thought if I were to go to my wife and say to her, Sean, uh, I want you to know how much I love you, and you have first place in my life. You might think, wow, that's really impressive. She probably really appreciates that. But if I continue the thought with, but Sally has second, and Mary has third, and Susie has fourth, being first is not that impressive after that, because she knows there's a whole lot more in my heart and in my life uh, that I share interest with. So when we say to God, well, you have first place, uh, sometimes that's not good enough when they're second, third, and fourth. God says, I want your heart. I want your heart's affection. Uh, God is not content with being first among other things which rival his due glory and his due position. Uh, he said in Luke chapter 14, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. We see constantly reminded in the Gospels, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. God wants our heart. If I want victory, uh, yes, it comes slowly sometimes, but I've got to guard my heart. Let her see. Let her see. Uh, examine your heart. Examine your heart. Paul said to Colossians 3, 2, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. To what is my heart attached? To what does my heart long for most? Uh, to find out if your heart is truly attached to Christ, here's how you can examine it. First of all, look in these areas. First, how about your time? Do you enjoy being in His presence? Do you enjoy spending time with Him? Do you enjoy worshiping Him? Do you enjoy loving Him? Do you enjoy going to the throne of Almighty God? Do you enjoy uh, fellowship with fellow Christians around uh, the church house? Uh, what about my time? Number two, number two, as I examine my heart and see if it's fully uh, in Christ. What about my thoughts? What about my thoughts. Uh, what do I think about most? Proverbs 23 says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Proverbs also reminds us of chapter 4, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. What do I think about? Because here's the thing. What I think about is what's most important to me. And what's most important to me is the things that I'll take care of and do most in my life. What are my thoughts? Philippians 4, 8 reminds us to fill our mind with certain things, things that are lovely and just and honest and pure, good rapport, those types of things. Is that my thinking process? Does he have my heart? Does he have my thoughts? Does he have my time? Third way I examine my heart, not just my time and my thoughts, but how about, how about my giving? And I know we talk about this on Sunday even, but how about my giving? Time, talents, and treasure. Am I giving it to him? See, because here's, here, here's the true thing for Christians, and we understand this, especially the Wednesday night crowd. I can look at my, my checkbook, my credit card, whatever, statements, and I can, I can look through that and I can find out very quickly what I really value in life. Uh, do I value Christ? Uh, in, my, in my giving, my time, and my talents, and my treasures, do I value Him? Does He have my heart? If 
For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Examine your heart. Guard your heart. Don't lose heart. Remember, it's a slow process. And then letter D, prioritize your heart with joy. Make joy a priority. Make happiness and joy and a smile on your face an important thing. Get up in the morning and say, I'm going to smile today. I don't care what life hits me with, I'm going to smile today. I don't care what circumstances come, I'm going to have joy today. And when I meet that teller at Walmart and she's checking me out and she's down in the mouth and uh, maybe a little gloomy, I'm just going to smile and tell her to have a good day. I'm going to prioritize with joy. Remember the golden rule we often refer to that in Matthew chapter 7? Uh, what, whatsoever you would do, that men should do to you, do you even unto them. Think about this. What if you were depending on somebody else to bring you joy? Their joy equaled your joy. Uh, what if somebody else was depending on you? Their joy was equal to your joy. How would we be doing? Uh, what, if, what if we depended on somebody else to explain the plan of salvation like we explain the plan of salvation? What if we depended on somebody else to teach the Bible like we teach the Bible? Disciple somebody like we disciple somebody? Uh, love people like we love people? What if we were dependent on that? How would that equal out? How would that equate? How's my love? How's my discipling? How's my Bible study? How's my uh, sharing the plan of salvation? If, if others did it the way I did it, would the world be better off or, or would we be a stalemate or would it be worse? Uh, prioritize your heart with joy. Matthew or Mark chapter 10, the Bible says, For the Son of Man has come not to be ministered unto, but to minister. Let's, let's joyfully serve and love people. Joyfully love and serve people. What are we doing? We're prioritizing our heart with joy. Last letter E. Prepare your heart through prayer. Prepare your heart through prayer. Remember, don't, don't lose heart. It's slow. Uh, guard it, examine it, prioritize it with joy. And the last thing you see is to prepare it with prayer. Uh, when life gets hectic, go to God in prayer. When stress abounds, go to God in prayer. You remember when Jesus' life became hectic in the Gospels? What did he do? He, he, uh, he withdrew to a solitary place and he prayed. If it's good enough for him, believe me, it's good enough for us. When the big decisions need to be made, pray. By the way, that's what Jesus did. Remember the greatest victory ever occurred in his life was in solitary, the Garden of Gethsemane, where he prayed, not thy will, but mine, not my will, but thine be done. That was victory through prayer in a solitary moment in a stressful situation. Had that prayer not occurred, you know, maybe Calvary wouldn't have happened. I know I'm being a little uh, 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 assumptuous there, but, but think about that. The prayer was important, and he withdrew himself. Don't let life run you into the ground. Break away regularly and find time to be on your knees before him in prayer. Prepare your heart through prayer. Let me give this last thought, number 10. Number 10. We've seen all the ways to have victory. We've seen the path. We've seen the steps. We've seen what Christ provides for us. Number 10. The simple question is this, and we probably all have it. What if I fail? What if I fail? What if I fail? Let me tell you this. You're going to. So am I. We're not perfect. We're flesh. We're human. We're going to fail. What happens when I fail? Well, here's the great thing. 1 John 1, 9 still is true. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God has never failed you. Your failure does not weaken Him. He'll forgive us. He'll use our failure as a stepping stone, as a teaching instrument, uh, maybe for a similar situation that's going to occur in the future. Don't rely on past victories for future victory. And don't rest in past failures to say, I'm a failure today. Uh, remember this. Rely on Christ. Rely on His Word. Memorize Scripture. Apply it. And then quote it when needed. The only time you can live a victorious Christian life is right now. You can't live it in the past. You can't live it in the future. You can only live it today. So begin today. Uh, take the truths of this lesson and don't just apply some of the doctrinal things we talked about or the, the, the specific things. Apply them through experience in your life. Apostle Paul said this in Galatians 2.20. Uh, he says, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. You want to have victory? Let Christ live in you. Not, not, not let Him dwell in you. Let Him live in you. When he lives in you, he can live through you. And you can do some amazing things for him and be a victorious Christian if you just simply allow him to have his rightful place. Let's have victory, Christian. Uh, Calvary Baptist Church, let's be victorious as a church body. Let's be victorious as individual Christians. Let's be victorious for our community. They need to see victorious Christians. And a God who provides that for us. Let's have a victorious Christian life. Next week, uh, next week we're going we're gonna to change gears. And we're going to start a new series, probably seven or eight weeks. 
uh, and we're going to look at the topic of holy, 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 and we're going to see how to pursue God's glory and how to how to pursue that fact of, you know, be holy for I am holy. How can I strive for it? How can I try to apply it and live for it? Uh, what are some applications? And I'll look at that for the next few weeks. And so I encourage you to be back and to tune in next Wednesday. Thank you again for tuning in tonight. Thank you for letting me uh, finish the lesson the second week uh, out and then splitting that up for time. And uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, while I'm all the way here in Pensacola, Florida, uh, the wonders of modern technology. But uh, we look forward to seeing you Sunday. Uh, looking for a great service. Uh, continuing our service on the six pillars of a powerful church this Sunday morning. will be wow worship at 1030. Don't miss it. I think it will be very encouraging. And then, of course, our evening service continuing on the uh, biblical view of the end times. So I encourage you to be out for that as well. God bless you again. Thank you so much for tuning in. And we look forward to seeing you Sunday morning. God bless you. Christ. Look at the Bible.